Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Foltz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana. She's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Back in 1798, a Spanish colonial diplomat arrived in the city to assume his post. A home was built for his family in the unique West Indies Creole style, which was quite popular in his day. With its wide, inviting front gallery and tall, sloped island roof, the home was definitely a welcomed addition to the young city. By the mid-1970s, however, the beautiful plantation had fallen into decay and disrepair. Immediate attention was needed. Cynthia Reeves, a graduate of Tulane University and owner of a public relations firm, recognized this diamond in the rough waiting to be reborn. With her keen interest in history, architecture, fine dining, and hospitality, she converted this former indigo plantation into one of the premier small inns of New Orleans. And y'all, although it seems like it might be a million miles away, it's only 11 blocks to the historic French Quarter. I'm Jeff John Foles. Welcome to the house on Bayou Road, a petite Creole plantation. This gorgeous little hideaway located near the electrifying French Quarter of New Orleans allow guests to experience the sights and sounds of the city while embracing the architecture of the 19th century. Built on two acres off historical Esplanade Avenue, the house on Bayou Road truly exemplifies the meaning of peace, quiet, and tranquility. While meandering through the manicured gardens, one can enjoy the scent of fresh flowers, relax on screen southern porches, and view treasures of early New Orleans in a B&B that defines southern hospitality. For those of you wishing to cool down or heat it up, there's even a pool and covered hot tub. This private little Creole cottage is tucked away on the hundred-year-old live oaks and Spanish moss, and it's overfilled with French country furnishings, including a huge four-poster bed, and y'all, there's even a wet bar here. What chef wouldn't die for this kitchen? Just take a look at the intricate beamwork here from our past. Just off of the kitchen, owner Cynthia Reyes has decorated the spacious breakfast room with farmer's tables, open hutches, and family treasures. What a place to begin your day. The entrance parlor welcomes visitors to stop and rest for a moment from their hectic schedule in the Big Easy. Here, priceless antiques sporting intricate details give this room a feeling of opulence. And y'all, as an added perk, the entire staff of this B&B certainly know how to pamper their guests. Each of the suites are named for a bayou here in Louisiana, and the color schemes and appointments are just fabulous. Here in the Bayou Barataria room, a pencil post, four post a bed, and ladies' secretary enhance the accommodations. Isn't this just gorgeous? Wow. 
Uh, look at this little desk here. Mm, beautiful. And y'all step into the Bayou Delacroix suite and see Victorian elegance with its floral and lace patterns at its absolute best. What a place to lay your head. So y'all come to the Crescent City and allow Cynthia Reeves to pamper you in true Louisiana style here at the gorgeous house on Bayou Road. West Indies and Creole styles of architecture married in the city of New Orleans, y'all. I think one of the things that set our B&Bs apart here in the Bayou State is just that. Seven different nations coming to this area all about the same time and not only marrying their styles of architecture, food, customs, etc., but also keeping a lot of the identity. So this beautiful home certainly represents the Spanish style way back then. And the foods of that area are just incredible, that part of New Orleans. And the foods that came out of the Spanish style in the area are still very, very uh, uh, present in the city today and very evident of that Spanish style today. So I want to share a couple of them with you. Uh, one of the things that I want to do is to cook a salmon dish. Now, we could cook just about any fish whatsoever in this particular dish, but salmon, because of the color, is the fish that I've chosen. And in both of the dishes that I'm doing today, I'm including oysters because oysters are so much a part of early New Orleans. My God, the, the, the oyster bars all over the uh, downtown area. And the interesting thing also about the house on Bayou Road, y'all, just a stone's throw from the historic French Quarter, so, to, so you can just kind of walk five, six, seven blocks down and hey, sit at one of those oyster bars if you'd like. Let's take a look at the platter because this is the ingredients of that great Creole salmon dish with oysters, Rockefeller sauce, if you can imagine that. Uh, the salmon here, this is uh, Atlantic salmon. Some people think Atlantic salmon is the absolute best in the world. Uh, Scottish, you know, gives it a good run. Uh, and there's a lot of farm-raised salmon available today. Look how gorgeous this beautiful pink color is. I'm also going to flavor the sauce with spinach. You see this gorgeous spinach leaves and tasso, y'all. Tasso from the Spanish, tasajo, meaning dried or cured beef, another Spanish influence in the sauce. So listen, let me show you quickly how to make the oysters Rockefeller sauce. And you can uh, make this sauce not only for fish, but you can uh, use it as a soup. I mean, I mean, oysters Rockefeller soup, just fantastic. Uh, or naturally, you could, uh, uh, could use it on the chicken or one of those other uh, ingredients as well. Now, uh, I'm going to put a little butter into this, and then to make the sauce, I'm going to put in some of my New Orleans uh, seasonings here, or the seasonings of the rest of the world as well, the trinity of flavors, onions, celery, bell pepper, saute it around in a little buttery flavored oil here, and then garlic. I mean, my God, can you imagine Spanish? Creole cuisine without a lot of garlic. We love it. Gonna put that right down into the saute pan. And once the vegetables wilt, now I'm gonna add the tasso or tasajo. This is a kind of a ham, actually, if you think about it. It's a, it's a nice, uh, uh, heavily smoked piece of ham that is the spiciest of all of the Creole meats. Uh, normally, we use andouille or smoked sausage. We have a lot of different uh, smoked meats in our uh, uh, flavoring pantry, but tasso is definitely the spiciest. Now into that, some spinach, y'all. I'm going to just go ahead and break some spinach leaves right down into the dish because this, of course, is our sauce. So I'm going to wilt that spinach just for a second and then oysters. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there giving oysters a bad rap, but that's a raw oysters. Go ahead and make sure that you cook them, and in this particular case, they will be cooked totally, and the spinach will wilt in just a second, and then I'm going to flavor it with a little bit herb saint or perno, one of those French flavors from New Orleans, but definitely a lot of the Caribbean flavor as well. Perno or herb saint, that nice anise flavor, y'all. So I'm going to let this saute for just a second here for all of that to wilt. Now I have to uh, cook my salmon. So I'm going to season the salmon with just a little salt, a little bit pepper, not not too much, just put a little bit. Now you're probably going to ask yourself, should we go ahead and uh, dust this in flour? Should we put a little uh, 
uh, flour on the outside of it. Well, if you put flour on the outside, it's going to kind of cake up and put a nice little crusty coating on the outside. But for this particular dish, I like to see the salmon. So I'm not putting any flour on the outside. And y'all, I want to cook it medium rare. So I'm going to put it down right into that nice hot skillet like that. And I'm going to let that salmon saute for just a second until it gets a medium rare on the inside. And then I want to flip it over. It doesn't take long at all. You can watch the edges of the salmon. Once it starts to get that opaque look to it, then, of course, you can just kind of flip it over like that. And look how that nice little crusty brown already starts to form on the salmon. And basically, for my purposes, y'all, this salmon is already done. I would not cook that salmon any more than uh, what you see right there. Now, what do I do with the sauce to finish it? Well, I take it over to a blender or food processor. The tasso is cooked. The oysters are cooked. The, the green spinach is wilted. And I put it into the blender and puree it for just a second. And let me show you how I plate it up. I have some of that sauce already done. So take a look at my plate here. And I'm going to put that green sauce, look at that nice spinach, right down into that. And I'll spread that around a little bit. And you can imagine that nice spicy flavor of the tasso, that nice, beautiful uh, spinach that's got a nice fresh flavor to it, the parno with that great uh, flavor. Now I'm going to add a little more color to it. And y'all, that is the Caribbean salmon with the Oysters Rockefeller sauce, a beautiful dish from that house on Bayou Road. Now, another really interesting dish that we came up with, and, uh, and, and of course, has been cooked in the city of New Orleans for a long time, uses uh, this little vegetable right here, eggplant. And boy, I tell you what, you talk about oysters getting a bad rap. What about eggplant? I mean, uh, for, for generations, people thought it was poisonous. Uh, it came from the Middle East and made its way to New Orleans, to the Mediter from the Mediterranean. The French, the Spanish, the Italians all brought it over to New Orleans. And they created great soups and stuffings with it. So I want to show you one of the greatest dishes of, uh, uh, of New Orleans using eggplant. It's called potage for eggplant lovers. Can you say that? Potage for eggplant lovers. Okay, y'all, I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit olive oil. After all, Spanish, Mediterranean. Go ahead and put a little bit of the olive oil right into your cast iron pot. And I'm going to stir that around just a little bit. And again, I'm going to add the onion, celery, bell pepper, because we want to get all of those nice flavors going in our pot here. And I guess people wonder why can we develop different flavors using all like ingredients, onion, celery, bell pepper, garlic, in just about every dish we cook. But the fact is, once you put the base of flavors together, then it's all of the, in the accompanying ingredients that really make the dish stand out. So once that's sauteed, and look how hot that pot's cooking here, y'all. Now I'm gonna come into this with some nice uh, eggplant. Now a lot of times I recommend taking the eggplant and putting it into a colander with a little bit of salt and uh, let it drain for a couple of minutes because you want to get all of the bitterness out of the eggplant by allowing it to drain for just a second. But these eggplants cook so quickly, y'all. You can see that they diced here. When I'm making a soup, if I cut them fresh and they're young eggplant, I don't, uh, I don't worry too much about putting them in that colander. I just go dice from dice right to the pot. Okay, once this is sauteed for a second, let's just say that the eggplant uh, are, are wilted here. It takes about five minutes. I'm going to sprinkle in just a touch of flour because, again, you want to have a little root to thicken it. Uh, it just kind of give a nice uh, volute look to it, a nice kind of velvety finish to this soup. Just kind of stir that flour around. And whenever you make a cream-based soup, just enough flour to pick up the oil, in this particular case, olive oil, in the bottom of that pot. And you go ahead and stir that around and blend it nicely. Now, y'all, I have a great shellfish stock on the stove here. And I want you to take a look at that beautiful crabs and crawfish and all of that. And I'm going to go ahead and take a little bit of that stock. And you can imagine how flavorful this is. Huh. Even though I'm putting oysters in the finished soup, you can imagine the added flavor 
that crawfish and crab and all of those nice things bring to this soup. So I'm going to stir that in. And again, just enough roux to thicken that stock. And once it's uh, cooked in the stock, once the eggplant is cooked in the stock for just a couple of minutes, they're just going to fall apart, y'all. They're just going to literally fall apart. Now I'll add a little bit tomato sauce because this is tomato, and you can imagine that tomato normally accompanies eggplant in most dishes anyway, and then some heavy whipping cream, and I'm going to add about a cup of heavy whipping cream to the dish, stir that around, blend it in, it should take on a nice light pink color, and then I'll add the oysters because I want to just look how beautiful that dish is with that nice pink color, and then y'all, the oysters, I'm going to put in about half of my oysters with the oyster liquid. Now, of course, again, just be careful where you get the oysters from. Just use a reputable seafood supplier and make sure that they cook. That's the most important thing about oysters. To season it, well, salt, pepper, all of those interesting flavors. What, what herbs? I like oregano in this. I like a little tarragon in this uh, soup. Just go ahead and put some pepper, salt, your favorite herbs. Let it come to a nice rolling boil and y'all then I would go right into the food processor and blend it and serve it as a nice cream based soup that's all blended or you can serve it just like this. Well you saw that gorgeous kitchen at Cynthia Reeves house well she was good enough to bring me into that gorgeous kitchen with that great brick backdrop and teach me how to make one of her greatest salads her spinach and strawberry salad with a fabulous vinaigrette y'all hey join us. Cynthia, you know the last time I was here with you at the house on Bayou Road, I discovered this fantastic salad. Not only did it look great, but the textures, the strawberries, the spinach, it looked so great in the bowl, and the textures just jumped out at you. The guests must love it. Oh, they do, and they they particularly love the, the sort of surprise of the soft, juicy, sweet strawberries mixed in with the sort of savory of the salad dressing. It's well, wonderful. It, it's absolutely fantastic. I tell you what, why don't we make that dressing for them? Hey. And if uh, you have the whip, I'll just go ahead and pour. What do you have in here so I'm far? Whipped. Already we have an egg yolk. Okay. One egg yolk is all you really need to give it the nice emulsion that you Right. A little balsamic vinegar, any balsamic vinegar will do. It doesn't have to be one of those real expensive. Okay, good. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and whip that up right, right. off the shelf, huh? Uh -huh. I like a lot of balsamic, too. Mm, I do, too. Now, of course, strawberry wine, the secret ingredient. Should don't I drink, drink that? Some? No, no, no. That's for, that's for us. <laughs> okay, This a is Louisiana bit. strawberry wine, and it really gives it that ah. extra sweet, wonderful flavor. Oh, I love the flavor of that strawberry mm -hmm. wine, too. Now for herbs, a little thyme. Uh-huh. And a little basil next. All right, and I love tarragon in here too. Mm -hmm. oh, throw a little tarragon in it. Okay. Okay, now for sweetness. I did, I, we, we like to add those little strawberries. It gives it a little interest to the eye as well as adds a little more sweetness to the dressing. Mm -hmm. And this is the emulsion, and this is the wonderful part where you watch it sort of come together. It just uh, absolutely yeah. begins to get nice and creamy and delicious looking. Now, you know, I, I sometimes like to spice it up with a little pepper or a little salt, but actually with the strawberry wine and the fresh berries in it, you don't really need anything. Yeah, and it has such a wonderful aroma. You can actually smell it. It's wonderful. Oh, can you smell it? It's fantastic. Yeah, huh, look the emulsion's that, huh? beginning to start. Now, one of the things that I've noticed is that if I put this in the refrigerator for um, a day or two before I'm going to use it, the flavors blend and it becomes really wonderful mix and melange of flavors. And you just kind of shake it up from time uh -huh. to time to marry yeah. those flavors. Well, great. Got a little bit right here that well, we've already made up, so you can see how that all works. Right. Well, let me grab this out of the way. Okay. Good. Pull that so bowl of spinach up. Bowl in here. How about you pour? All right. Okay. Great. Okay. Add a few more of these luscious. Just go ahead and throw them right in yeah. there. Look how beautiful that is. Huh, look at the colors in that salad. And from our herb garden, I also like to add a few edible flowers, which really set it off and make it just gorgeous. And, and you these know, come out of the garden. And look at that beautiful bowl. It almost makes the salad taste better already. Indeed. 
Let's go try some. Ah, uh, what a gorgeous salad, y'all. And think of a vinaigrette with strawberry wine in it. It was just magnificent and unique and, of course, complements the spinach perfectly with the color. You, try that. you have to try that recipe. It's great. But take a look at this eggplant soup potage for eggplant lovers. I'm going to finish it again with just a little touch of herbs. Look at the color, how nice and rosy this is. Just beautiful. And I have to taste this. But remember, you might want to go ahead and puree it. I mean, Mm -hmm. Ah, beautiful flavor, y'all. Really nice and delicate. And think about it. Throw it in, a, in a, a food processor or a blender and just puree it. Use it as a sauce, too. Think about that on the bottom of salmon or so. Now, a couple other great dishes we found at the house on Bayou Road, definitely Spanish. Take a look at these Creole quesadillas here, y'all. This is actually crawfish sautéed with onion, celery, bell pepper, three different mushrooms, the wild oyster mushrooms of Louisiana, chanterelles, and button mushrooms, and then flavored with Monterey Jack. Right next to that, my chocolate java mousse. Whoo, right on top of that, a little coffee. This is chocolate with coffee right in it. Again, very Spanish, very, very tasty. Now, y'all, Cynthia Reeves and I not only made that gorgeous salad with that beautiful salad dressing, but also went into the parlor where we sat, and she told me about what it took to renovate that home and her love for it. Why don't y'all come into the parlor with us? Cynthia, what a great salad that is, the spinach, and of course, the strawberries, just great. Don't you dare let me forget that salad dressing in the refrigerator when I leave. I'll make sure you take it with you. Good. The beautiful architecture that's seen from the street uh, level on this house is uh, referred to as West Indies Creole. Exactly what does that mean? Well, Creole, of course, means born in the New World. And uh, a lot of the people that migrated uh, to Louisiana from the indigo colonies, the French indigo colonies in the West Indies, brought with them the style they knew best, which is this open air style with galleries or porches around, built for ventilation, cross ventilations, built to be cool but in a lush tropical setting. Now, the house dates back to the late 1700s. There must just be a fabulous history associated with it. Well, this September we celebrate our 200th birthday, which we're going to have a big birthday party. <laughs> um, yes, the, the house was built in 1798 for the Director General of the Royal Hospital during the Spanish occupation, a Domingo Fleitas, a very wealthy uh, doctor of his time. Now, you somehow came upon the house and realized that it was this uh, diamond in the rough that needed to be renovated. How did that happen? Well, I was coming back from the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, and I literally drove in front of the house and heard it go, you hoo I'm over <laughs> here. It didn't have a scrap of paint on it. Uh, and some lovely little old ladies who had been born in the house and were in their 90s were still living here. And um, we met, we talked, and a month or so later, they said, you're the one, you can have it. The rest is history. Huh? Yeah. Now, once you bought the house and renovated it, uh, you decided to open it to the public. Was that a tough decision? Well, in a way it was, but in another way, this house has always been a place uh, where people gathered, families, over, over the 200 years of its existence. As much as I can tell, there were a lot of gatherings here, and it was a house that was full of people, and, and so it lends itself to that. And I think the house is happy to have people in it. Uh, there are so many great hotels in the New Orleans area. They're coming up. They're getting grander every day. Why a B&B over a hotel? Why would a guest choose a B&B? Well, it's a real special experience to be in a historic house. And then one of the things that I think most B&B owners um, pride themselves on is really giving hospitality and service on a real individual basis. My guests arrive as strangers, but when they leave, we're friends. They're, they weren't just a person who paid me money and spent the <laughs> and night. Spend the night. Now, I, I know I'm real particular. I go into a hotel and I want a fax machine, I want a telephone, I want all of these amenities. How would I select a B&B &B that fits my lifestyle? Well, that's an interesting question, John, because when you're searching around, I'm always amazed at how people find the right B&B &B for them. There's a lot of questions you can ask. And some of them will tell you right away, this is what I want. If the owner said, yeah, we serve breakfast with the family, the dog, the cat, the everybody, that's a homestay. And, and some people really want to have that experience, particularly out in the country. 
in the city, if people need more amenities, you should ask about, you know, do you have telephones in the rooms, robes and slippers, complimentary sherry, you know, just all the wonderful things that you would ask for in a hotel. Now, every room in this house is different. Every room is just fantastic. But I keep migrating to one special room, the kitchen, because it's so great. But I, I hear you give cooking classes in there as well. Yes. That wonderful kitchen has just been a, a mecca for people to, to gravitate to. And we do hands-on classes, and we have a lot of guest chefs. And, uh, and if you're not doing anything uh, <laughs> one Saturday afternoon for about four hours, we have 12 students who would love a class. <laughs> I'm going to keep that in mind. <laughs> Cynthia, thanks so much for allowing us to be oh. a part of uh, the house on Bayou Road today. And I guarantee you, we're going to come back, and I may very well take you up on that cooking I'll class. I'll be looking for you. <laughs> Good. And, uh, Thank all of you for stopping by as we continue to visit the bed and breakfasts of the Bayou State and cook up more great taste of Louisiana. Now, uh, let's talk about that cooking class a little bit. Any money involved? I mean, y'all pay. <laughs> to learn more about A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Folsom Company, visit PBS online at the internet address on your screen. Hot beignets and warm boudoirs by Chef John Folsom is available for $29.95. This companion book to the series features over 150 recipes. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen. Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Fultz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans-style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana. She's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. <laughs>